On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, we discuss how abuse contributes to self-sabotaging behavior. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and we're going to be talking about all things self-sabotage today. But if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story episodes, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our guest forum page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button and please send it in the format that we ask for. So today we are going to be discussing self-sabotage, all things self-sabotage. And I just wanted to do this episode because our podcast isn't just about abuse, but it's also about self-discovery and understanding how uh, self-sabotage can occur, uh, the the traits or the signs and the behaviors of self-sabotage and how they are formed because of the trauma that we went through either in childhood or through relationships. Uh, so this is why I kind of wanted to do this uh, episode just to kind of bring a bit more of a self-discovery uh, this week when discussing a topic that surrounds abuse. So the psychological definition of self-sabotage. So self-sabotage occurs when we destroy ourselves physically, mentally, or emotionally, hindering our own success and well-being by undermining our personal goals and values. And this can be done consciously or unconsciously. Self-sabotage, also known as behavioral dysregulation, can be conscious or unconscious depending on levels of awareness. An example of conscious self-sabotage is deciding to eat French fries despite a goal to eat healthy. An unconscious self-sabotage happens when a personal goal or value has been undermined, but not initially recognized. So, for example, wanting to get a specific piece of work done, but you're overextending yourself with so many different types of work that you want to accomplish as well, you get overwhelmed, then nothing gets done. You haven't prioritized anything, and because you haven't prioritized anything, all of this stuff doesn't get done at all. So when this happens, you will obviously get upset. You might get a little bit depressed, you know, it can kind of get you into a rut. It starts to kind of deplete your drive and your motivation. It can make you anxious as well, very anxious. I I go through this all the time. You could end up being sad. And then it also will have a toll on your self-esteem. Like there's just this kind of domino effect that can happen when self-sabotage is occurring. So for many people, we don't know why we self-sabotage. And if you've listened to our podcast, our survivor stories, we hear a lot of stuff that comes from your childhood. You know, we talk a lot about uh, perfectionism, uh, pessimism. There's a lot of things that are going on, especially when you have no autonomy from your parent and you're underneath your parent's thumb. So why do we self-sabotage? So here are four possible causes of self-sabotage. So first up on our list is modeling and self-sabotaging behaviors can come from childhood models and patterns such as a parent who lacked confidence to succeed. And that lack of confidence can then become ingrained in you. So a parent who consistently warns a child to be careful at the playground may cause that child to internalize the world as being unsafe and exploration of this world to be avoided. So, you know, that, you know, you're instilling this fear here in this example, in this modeling example for your child, and that child might then be afraid to do things themselves. They could end up self-sabotaging situations because this fear has been instilled in them. 
And with this modeling, with this specific example here of a lack of confidence and fear, a child may grow up not starting things, or they could start things, but then feel very uncomfortable, you know, finding a roadblock, not knowing how to fight through and quitting. And this can then throw them down a rabbit hole of not feeling good enough. And this can reverberate all through your work and your relationships. And number two on our list is rejection or neglect. So being rejected or neglected by a parent can cause low self-esteem and other negative self-image issues. And this can compel us to sabotage personal relationships in an effort to avoid further vulnerability and rejection. And number three on our list is childhood survival techniques. And as a child, and you are specifically in abusive households, you learned how to adapt to survive. Uh, You change behavior to fit in, and this can be not rocking a boat, not communicating, being passive aggressive to survive might have been encouraged in your family. We hear a lot of that on our survivor story episodes, specifically when it comes to how you interact with your siblings, golden child scapegoat dynamics could be going on. Your family could be gossipers. You might lie in your family because you're afraid of consequences. So as you grow older, these things will stop working for you when it comes to normal relationships or what we deem healthy relationships or being at work. And, you know, you're taking these old survival techniques and bringing them into these new situations that aren't these abusive situations, which which aren't the same types of people you've been dealing with in the past. So you could be self-sabotaging and you need to learn to remove this programming that has been in you your whole entire life so you can, you know, move forward in a world where that abusive household doesn't exist. You know, I said childhood survival techniques, but this can also be survival techniques that uh, happened within an abusive relationship that you learned over time that you'll have to unlearn in the aftermath uh, of abuse as well if it starts to hinder you going forward. And then the last one on our list is trauma. So if you are a child who is abused specifically by a person of trust, You may look at the world as being very unsafe and you might view yourself as feeling undeserving of good things in your life. You know, those thought processes eventually can lead to a lot of self-sabotaging, whether it be in the workforce, uh, with friends, uh, or in relationships going forward. So now that we discussed possible reasons for self-sabotage, let's discuss signs of self-sabotage. So number one on our list is perfectionism. And this is putting yourself down or picking apart everything you do, not letting mistakes go and replaying everything you did wrong. That is perfectionism. And this leads you to feeling like you'll never be good enough. The goal of perfection is very unrealistic and you're constantly feeling like you don't measure up. This leads to low self-esteem, higher feelings of failure, Your fear of making mistakes paralyzes you from taking many productive steps ahead and you're just being overly self-critical and this can affect your mental health. You can result in feelings of loneliness, helplessness, anxiety, and depression. So when it comes to perfectionism and self-sabotage, when looking at relationships as a whole, right at the beginning, someone with perfectionism might think that they're not good enough. So instead of looking at a partner or a potential partner and thinking, are they good enough for me? Are they matching my values, et cetera? They might be thinking, am I good enough for the other person? And that's setting up this self-sabotage of putting your worth into someone's hands right off the bat of a relationship. And once your worth is in someone else's hands, that's not a good uh, place to start your relationship from. And next up on our list, we have pessimism. And pessimism, you know, this is when you're really picking apart a situation to find out all of the flaws. Uh, You know, you're surprised when plans work out. 
you might be sabotaging your relationships with pessimistic outlooks. This can destroy relationships and goals by not seeing the good parts of things. You're only seeing, you know, what can go wrong or what has gone wrong. You don't see progress in things. Ten good things might have happened and you've only seen this one bad thing that happens and you become this person who's just picking these flaws apart. And that can hinder you at work and going into new relationships. And, you know, a subcategory to this is the self-fulfilling prophecy. And that is an expectation or belief that can influence your behaviors, thus causing the belief to come true. And the idea behind a self-fulfilling prophecy is that your belief about what will happen drives the actions that will eventually become the outcome, and that outcome will happen. So in relation to pessimism and the self-fulfilling prophecy, if you expect something to go wrong and you're a pessimist about these situations, a lot of the time you might put in unconsciously less effort and fail to take the steps that could turn these things around, which means that you're expecting the worst, which brings out the worst. And, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy and pessimism are very closely entwined. So let's say you grew up and you got a model of family relationships that weren't very good, that you didn't have good relationships with anyone in your family. You have a history of uh, relationships that didn't go well romantically, possibly as well. So you have a belief that you might not be good at relationships. You never have been and never will be. So when you do get into a relationship, you might not concentrate on that relationship. You might spread yourself thin. So when fights might start occurring in this relationship, it will reinforce your belief that you are not good at relationships and you won't do much to improve the situation. And this is where, you know, this pessimism of you not being good in relationships and the self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, really intertwine. And eventually this relationship ends and this prophecy uh, will be fulfilled. And same with the pessimism. Up next on our list, we have procrastinators. And procrastinators usually wait until the night before to finish specific types of work, if it's school or if it is at work. And you could wait like right before a holiday to make any preparations for that holiday. Procrastination or putting off a task is very easy to do if you are feeling overwhelmed, you're tired, you're mentally drained. And this isn't just avoiding a task that you don't feel into because that is very normal from time to time. This is more of giving into that feeling of not being into it on a very regular basis. And this can hold you back in many areas of your life. And because of that, you end up being dissatisfied with everything you do, uh, whether it be school or work and procrastinators have very high stress levels and anxiety levels, and they're also way more prone to depression. Number four on our list of signs that you might be a self-sabotager is disorganization. And this is when you feel like you are all over the place. You might be late all the time. You might be missing deadlines all the time. Chaos is your normal way of life. And this out of control feeling that comes with being disorganized can lead to emotional eating, increased feelings of depression, hopelessness, stress. Obviously, this adds a lot to stress. 
So I am very disorganized. I know I have to get organized and I don't have any real processes to answering my emails and keeping track of so many different things. So when getting episodes together and calls every week, I really do stress out getting everything done in the week really stresses me out. So in a sense, I am sabotaging my mental health. And this is just one of the many things on our list today that I can pretty much give personal examples for. But uh, specifically with disorganization, I have one parent who is organized and I have another one that is uh, not. And I took after uh, the one that is not. And up next is imposter syndrome. So you might be very good at doubting your own abilities. You know, confidence plays a big thing here. You might not have a lot of confidence if you if you have imposter syndrome. You might find it hard to give yourself credit for your own successes. You might feel like a phony, and this can lead to some big self-sabotage. So for example, you might not try for jobs that you want, promotions that you want, relationships that you want. You might not reach out to others because you often feel as if nobody wants to hear what you have to say. You don't honor boundaries. You don't speak up for yourself when others treat you badly. And you often like really don't make a big deal out of things because you feel like others are just kind of putting up with you. And this lack of confidence in relationships or at work can hit shame, rejection, the feelings of worthlessness, and it can really cause a lot of stress. And then there's the fear of rejection and someone can end or consider ending a relationship over the fear of rejection. And the next one we have on our list is overcommitments. So overcommitments can take a really big toll on you. It is self-sabotage in a variety of ways. Taking on too much leads to not being able to finish everything you start. You get feelings of guilt and obligation associated with overcommitment, which makes it very difficult to speak up for yourself or set healthy boundaries. And it sets you up to put yourself last all the time, which just makes stress even worse. And overcommitment leaves you open to constantly being asked to do more things for other people to just give a little more. And this can become a very big problem uh, at work. And this can be a big problem in, in relationships as well. Earlier, we gave an example when it came to work, but for relationships, not just romantic, spreading yourself thin, not wanting to disappoint others can take a toll on your health. You don't want to disappoint people, but in the long run, it's okay to say no. You know, healthy friends will understand, and it's best to say no early uh, than to overcommit and possibly back out at the last second. Uh, if that happens a lot, it can really cause tensions on uh, both sides. But, you know, overcommitting yourself is a form of self sabotage. Up next on our list is burnout. And when it comes to burnout, you might be living in a constant state of stress, exhaustion, and burnout can lead to some serious issues like mental and physical illnesses, relationship troubles, it can even hurt your finances. And these things can really turn physical, headaches, stomach aches, indigestion, just a lot of weird physical symptom, symptoms can manifest from being burnt out. And this is a way for your body to tell you to just kind of stop and think about what is going on when these physical things are happening. So burnout could have manifested in a way growing up where society or family tells us that we need to be productive. You know, we have to make X amount of money and like this is how we are valued. So we burn out based upon being this production, this producer. You know, this is where our value is coming from and it can be a coping mechanism. 
And a while ago, we had an episode where someone learned the admirable trait of bending over backwards to help people to the point of burnout. You know, this causes burnout bending over backward for people. They became a martyr to help people. That was their value. That's how they felt that, you know, they were a productive person in society or for someone else that they martyred themselves. And when you get to this point, you get to this point of burnout, you're not helpful to yourself anymore. You're not helpful to others anymore. And, you know, burning yourself out to do all of these things to produce, to create value, to be valued is a self-sabotaging behavior. And another sign of self-sabotage is self-medication. And this is obviously a coping mechanism uh, as well. I guess all of these are coping mechanisms, uh, we can say. But, um, you know, self-medication is one where it's like really in your face as what a lot of people see as as a coping mechanism. And it's just you trying to soothe yourself. But as we know, when you're a self medicator of drugs, uh, alcohol, a, a lot of different addictions, this can be a self sabotaging behavior, whether it comes to work uh, and relationships. And obviously, the self medication comes, as with all of these things, from a, a trauma of some sort that happened uh, at one point in your life. So next up on our list is cognitive dissonance as a sign of self-sabotage. And this is when we have two conflicting ideas at the same time that are just going to be kind of running into each other. So if you are going to be marrying someone who you think is amazing, but you came from this very unstable environment where as we mentioned, modeling before where uh, 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 modeled for you has been something just been unstable and you get the belief in your head that you don't believe that marriages can be stable because your parents did not have a stable marriage. Maybe one of your parents left or and then one of your parents after that started to have a series of different relationships over and over and over again. You might have this belief that marriage isn't stable, that you don't believe in this thing, yet then you are going to get married to someone who you think is great. Eventually, this thought process can be a very self-sabotaging behavior when these two things meet while you are married, and you'll start to see things crumble from there because this belief has taken over, and you have these two conflicting ideas going on at the same time. And that was the last one on our list of signs for self-sabotaging behavior. So the last thing I wanted to discuss before we end this episode are the two biggest things that I hear from survivors when talking to them, you know, prepping them for the show to be on our Survivor Story episodes is, you know, when they're getting into new relationships, uh, two big things that get in their way are past traumas and how the body reacts uh, to a new relationship when a conflict arises. And then the second one that we hear a lot on the show, and I also hear in conversations is, you know, that love doesn't feel right when there's not a lot of drama around, that, that chaos feels like home. So when it comes to the past traumas that you have that come rushing back at the first sign of conflict, when you have unresolved trauma from past relationships, your nervous system will automatically react in uh, fight, flight, freeze mode at the first sign of this conflict. So even though you are in a very healthy relationship, it's a loving relationship, It feels like the past trauma, either from your childhood or from your ex-partner, is going to happen all over again. It's this body reaction that's very hard to stop. Uh, You know, it's out of control because your brain and your body are are registering that a threat 
can happen at any second. That's what your body is is used to. And before you know it, you might be in this survival mode where, you know, you could be defending or, or attacking or, or completely shutting down. Your mind knows that your partner, the person that you're with, is not like the person from the past. But these natural body reactions uh, don't know this yet. It needs to acclimate to this person in a long term way, uh, knowing that these things are not a threat. So instead of being able to be present and become closer by getting through this conflict with your healthy partner, you uh, will fight back in some way. You could leave the room, you could become silent, or you can just completely shut them out as a response. And this is body instinctive response and it's not your fault when when this happened this is just how your body is reacting to these past traumas either from your childhood or from uh, relationships uh, with an abuser and you know this can create this self-sabotaging uh, behavior that is just naturally in there this 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 trauma response you know these things are are just to reiterate these things are not your fault and um, these are things to, to know that are there and to uh, be something that can, that can be worked on and, you know, just to not throw the relationship away uh, based upon uh, your reactions to these things, that these things can uh, be changed. And a big one that we hear on the show all the time, and the second one, as I mentioned before, is uh, the thing about chaos. And for a lot of people who are coming from chaotic home life and, and maybe a relationships that were very chaotic, that love doesn't really feel right without the chaos there. So whether it's been from your childhood or past relationships, your experience of love has all been about drama and trauma, and there could be violence in there as well. And we hear a lot of people when they try to get into relationships with healthy people that they kind of find it boring. They don't know what to do with it. You know, your whole body feels comfortable around all of the drama and these kind of toxic relationships. So, now that you're in this regular, normal, healthy relationship, you don't really know what to do with it. And a lot of people, you know, they equate all of this drama with love. And when that isn't going on, they don't know at all what to do with it. And it can be very self-sabotaging because many people who go into these situations, when your partner is isn't being dramatic or they're just kind of being calm, you know, they're, they're caring for you and loving you in these small ways, except for a lot of people, it doesn't feel like it is big enough. It doesn't feel like it's enough, you know, what, what's going on. So even if you get mad at them, your partner might be pretty relaxed about it. And you might think that they don't care because you're used to people who are yelling and screaming. And that's the only way that you knew someone uh, to care. So it's, it, it takes a long time for your, you know, your, your nervous system to adapt to uh, having no drama uh, around. And it can be very uncomfortable. It can be very unsettling to be around that. And it's something that you might run away from because it doesn't feel comfortable. You might be used to someone who, after a big fight, gives you a big gift to make up for things, whereas this calm, healthy person doesn't do that. And you might equate getting these big gifts or this love bombing stuff after all these things are happening with love. And it takes a very long time to to really process everything and get your body up to speed. Your brain might know it, but your body might feel it in a different way. And you might leave these relationships because they might be uncomfortable and you might not feel Feel like you're getting what you want or the responses that you want because that's what you're used to. But in a healthy relationship, these big responses 
aren't really there. You know, things are talked through, things are much calmer. So this is an other uh, big thing that we hear when it comes to self-sabotaging behavior. And it's a really, really big one when they uh, someone encounters someone who is healthy compared to an unhealthy situation that they once were in before. So uh, today's episode with self-sabotage, you know, a lot of this stuff that we're doing is not just about the abuse, but it's about self-discovery. And I wanted people to hear, you know, how these self-sabotaging behaviors could have been formed, where they come from, how they manifest in different ways. And what I want most for everyone is to be able to uh, leave the relationships that they are in, but also heal from past traumas and to live lives that are healthy and where, where you're happy. And, you know, these behaviors sometimes can, can work against you. And it's up to all of us to, to work on them if we do want to work on them and create less conflict and more balance in our lives. And what's also interesting is that some of these self-sabotaging behaviors can also, you know, these beliefs that we have, like the perfectionism and things like that, abusers can actually take these things and use these things against you if... Um, they, they, they want to, you know, specifically with stuff like perfectionism, they can attack your competency and things like that. So you can see them from the other angles as well as how it's not self-sabotaging, but when you put some of these, uh, behaviors or traits or beliefs in, in the, in the hands of an abuser. And once everything is uneven and in their hands, they can sabotage you, through these things as well. So I just wanted to kind of go through all of this stuff so we can kind of figure out more about ourselves. And that's how I view the show, that it's not just about uh, abuse, but it's also about self-discovery and and learning the processes of who you are and who you are also dealing with and how these behaviors can be used by uh, both of you. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode today and, and took a lot from it. And if you want to be a guest on our Survivor Story episodes, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. At top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse.gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. Also at our website, we have our very own support group. So if you need support, please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Press the support group button at the top of the page. There you'll see that we have our very own safe social network. We have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on and for you to get the validation that you need. And you can validate other survivors as well. It's a great group of people on there in our support group. So join that today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. At DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you are dealing with. They have every phone number, email address, and web address for uh, shelters and agencies. No matter how big or small the town you are in, DomesticShelters.org has it there. And that is it for our show. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. And I hope you have a good night. Night.